Half-Life Alex is, thus far, the best game of the worst decade, the burning 20s. It's gorgeous, plays beautifully, and represents an exciting new frontier for not only the Half-Life series, but for VR experiences in general. Its world feels lived in, breathed in, fresh and tactile, like absolutely nothing else in video games right now, revealing the thrilling promise of VR's as of yet largely unrealized potential. With the release of this game, the talented developers at Valve have, at long last, definitively proven VR to be more than an expensive novelty, a passing fad, a headline grabber. Gone are the days when all we had to show for this incredible technology were glorified carnival attractions. In true Half-Life fashion, Alex has put to bed the question of VR's legitimacy, making a near indisputable case for the technology as a viable art form, clearing nearly all the remaining barriers but one, the prohibitive cost of the devices. It is that barrier, regrettably, that prevented me from experiencing Valve's latest masterpiece firsthand. Yep, I hope you all enjoyed my riveting review of this amazing video game that I haven't played. In admitting my lack of direct experience with Half-Life Alex, I have surely discredited my opinion in the eyes of many viewers. And if you're one of those viewers, that's fine. I don't need you to agree with me about a video game. I already know what I think. But my opinion didn't come from nowhere. It isn't unique, but I also didn't inherit it from many of the games reviewers who agree with me on it. Rather, my opinion came from an experience of Half-Life Alex that I had. An indirect experience, to be sure, and arguably a compromised one, but one that I'd nonetheless argue to be legitimate. Through YouTube recordings, I've gotten to know and love Half-Life Alex in much the same way one might get to know another country by perusing photos, travel vlogs, and guides. <laughs> Except that's not really a fair com- Comparison, now is it? Were City 17 a real country, and not a series of video game levels strung together in the shape of a world, my second-hand opinion of it would be discounted by the fact that there would be people yet to meet, places yet to see, experiences yet to be had. But it is not so. This is a video game, and while some variance is possible, it is necessarily limited by the constraints of the medium, the intentions of the developers, and the practical realities of game development. And thus, my experience of Half-Life Alex's City 17, though certainly incomplete, is much more complete than, say, the average weeb's experience of Japan. Plus, City 17 is a country I already visited before in, you know, the previous game, so. But of course, it's not as if I'm abstaining from playing Alex so as to make a point or whatever. I'd love to play it, I'd prefer to, in fact. It's not that I wouldn't play it if I could, it's that I can't. In that, I am not alone. And you know what else I'm not alone in? <laughs> playing Animal Crossing New Horizons. <laughs> Animal Crossing New Horizons is a game that a lot of people are playing, and for a pretty good reason. It's a pretty good game. It got rave reviews, sold millions of copies, moved switches, and got banned in China, which is like a Medal of Honor now, isn't it? But while Animal Crossing moved switches, Half-Life Alex has moved more Twitch viewers than VR headsets. And while it has been relatively successful in doing so, as VR games go, and it will almost certainly have an as-yet-unknowable impact on VR game development in the future, it's certainly not setting the world on fire. And if a Half-Life VR game, and by all accounts, an excellent one at that, won't set the world on fire, then clearly no VR game will. Or at least, not any single VR game. But like I said, it moved Twitch viewers. The game's wider audience hasn't been direct. The game's wider audience has, as I have, experienced Alex secondhand. In this video, I want to argue the validity of experiencing games secondhand 
talk about why people have taken to experiencing Alex this way, and then proceed to complain about neoliberalism. If you're down for that, I hope you'll stick with me today. Hopefully, it'll be a pretty okay time. So, without further delay... I've always adored video games. That's been a basic fact of my life for as long as I can remember. I couldn't tell you how or when I first encountered video games, but I do remember the gaming experiences that defined my childhood, and most of those experiences came to me at a distance. I grew up in the golden age of the Wii, the sixth best-selling console of all time, and let me tell you, its wild success was very noticeable on a day-to-day -day basis. It dominated the store shelves, it was at everyone's house and every birthday party. Everyone and their dog, and their dog's dog, and their cat's mouse had a Wii and a Wii Sports. That was almost the only thing anyone ever actually did with it, it seemed. Wii Sports, and also the Mii creator, the undisputed greatest character creator of all time, don't at me. My family, however, did not have a Wii. Why play Wii Sports, my mom would say, when we could play sports as a family or whatever. We did, however, have a PS2, a DS, a GBA, and a PS3 until my mom broke it. For much of my life, my parents tightly regulated my access to all of these things. They didn't really let me play video games. With a few noted exceptions, they certainly didn't care about them, and my sister didn't really care about them that much either. They didn't buy these things because video games. They bought these things to shut me up about us not having any video games, which was the case for most screens in our household. We only ever had internet because my mom needed it to keep up with our friends, and my dad's job required it. We only ever had a TV when our neighbors handed off their old CRTs to us when they decided to upgrade. My sister and I were never allowed phones until they became necessary to communicate, and even then they were shitty flip phones. And it wasn't like we couldn't afford any of this stuff. My parents just didn't want to spend any more money than the bare minimum on any screen. As a result of all this, I am no stranger to experiencing video games at a distance. Most video games that I was interested in, I experienced at a distance. In the earliest years of my childhood, this happened by way of gaming magazines, the same way many Gen X and Wires got to experience video games. I, just as they did in years past, spent hours and hours at stores and libraries, poring over these things, fascinated by the colorful screenshots and lively descriptions of all the worlds beyond my reach. But eventually, many of these publications went out of print or fell to the backs of store shelves, becoming less prominent as I entered my preteen years. As a result, I began to, and to this day continue to, experience games less often in print and more often online, on gaming review websites and on YouTube. And this was the primary avenue through which I introduced myself to Portal. Portal was a game that I almost instantly fell in love with and knew I needed to play. So, being the insufferable pretentious teenager I was, I used it as the newest stick to beat the games are art, I swear, argument over the heads of my parents. To give you a rough, rough idea of how that went, Years later, I was playing through one of the Elizabeth scenes in Persona 3 while my mom was in the other room and she complained loudly about the robot voice. To which I responded, irritably, it's an English dub. Could you please wait here for a moment? There's something I've been curious about for a while. 
She insisted that it was a robot, like the robot voice that announces upcoming stops on the subway, until I pulled out my phone, googled and recited the name of Elizabeth's English VA from Persona 3, to which my mom was just kind of like, whatever. Basically, my mom is the sort of person who will call things art when she thinks it looks like art to her, and deny that designation to whatever things she sees as beneath art, and justify that attitude with whatever reasons suit her. Anyway, I didn't really have a point there, I guess, other than to name-check Ian Danskin's tomato video. Point is, they said no. So I took to YouTube and watched playthroughs, without commentary, of both Portal 1 and 2. Tepidly at first, thinking I would eventually play the games once I finally liberated myself from my family, and that I didn't want them to be ruined when I did. But that snowballed quite quickly, until I said, Oh, screw this, I've already seen so much, and watched the whole of the games. At first I felt a bit guilty, that I was spoiling these classic games for myself. But my enchantment with these games, my urge to experience them in some form, far outweighed my fear of spoilers. And so I watched the walkthroughs, and I watched more of them multiple times, and I watched walkthroughs of mods and community-created maps, because I was just that hungry for all of that delicious portal content. I eventually did get to play the games, and when I did, I felt like Maybe they had been ruined, like something had been lost by watching those playthroughs. Nothing in them hit me that hard. I barely got a rise out of all the big story beats. I liked the gameplay, I thought the game was fun and was good, but don't get me wrong, it was awesome. I still loved and still do love Portal, but it just wasn't new to me anymore, and I thought, at the time, that perhaps I'd have gotten something better somehow if I'd simply waited until I could play the games. But thinking about it now, after having gone and watched Half-Life Alex and enjoyed it, I don't think that's true. Because like I said at the beginning, I love Half-Life Alex, despite not having played it. I know already that I like it, that I had a good time watching it that the story in the world felt impactful to me. A compromised experience, but an experience nonetheless. And thinking about that feeling that I had experiencing Portal 1 and 2 again, that I was enjoying them, just not for the first time, I think my feeling was less so much indicative of the games being ruined, and more that I was just seeing them again. Stick with me on this. Like watching a movie of a book I've read, or vice versa. Okay, so when I watched the Hunger Games movie, I hadn't yet gotten around to reading the book, of which the movie is a near one-to-one -one adaptation. And when I read the book, finally, I had much the same feeling as when I had played Portal 1 and 2 after having seen walkthroughs of them. I still liked the Hunger Games, and I still do. It's some pretty solid teen dystopian fiction about how media owned by the exploiter class commodifies exploitation and co-ops revolutionaries to weaken the power of their message and like, wow, that's relevant and I might make a video about that. Anyway, I liked the story in both of its forms, I just got the same story twice in different formats. And the same story didn't hit exactly the same way the second time. I think that's the more apt way to describe the difference between Let's Plays of video games and the games themselves. Not a difference of substance, exactly, but a difference of medium. Some games might work better when watched as Let's Plays than actually being played directly. Some games might certainly be diminished if you chose to experience them 
them through the medium of a Twitch stream. Sometimes it might depend on who exactly is playing and whatever they might add. But I think that the choice between those two mediums is ultimately a matter of preference, and both experiences are ultimately valid. But like I said, while I enjoyed experiencing Half-Life Alex this way, I would have preferred to experience it directly in its intended original medium. And why did so many folks choose this medium for this game, rather than the almost surely superior medium of VR? There's a few articles speculating about why Half-Life Alex hasn't set the world on fire. Generally, the argument boils down to the technology being unappealing or unconvincing to consumers in some way, and they try to justify this by either citing their own experience with the game and pointing to VR's many technical headaches, or ending their analysis at, oh well, people must just not like it, I suppose. And yeah, sure, okay, there's probably at least some truth to those points. Not everyone is going to like VR, and there are many valid reasons not to. The technology has many inherent weaknesses and limitations, and those weaknesses and limitations aren't going to just go away. Clever design and engineering can mitigate or work around those limitations, but it won't make them disappear. Half-Life Alex is itself full of concessions designed to work around those weaknesses, and it's consequently an extremely janky game, even as it's a step up from Half-Life 2 in many ways, and the most refined and polished iteration of a VR title thus far. Who put this? Who put all this on here? Okay, take that. Take that. Yeah. All right, still won't open. There. Get. Oh my god. All right. Gotta shoot these. Take the boards. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right. And that's pretty much what it's like to open a door in this game. The gravity gloves, the more forgiving enemy AI and ammo pickups, the heightened focus on exploration, all the features created to make Half-Life work in VR and work relatively smoothly. And they're smart design choices, but they're obviously not perfect, and they'll age over time as better versions of these things come along in future games. And that's fine. Half-Life has always been trying new things and pushing boundaries, and as a consequence of that, they've always been pretty janky games, especially by today's standards. Half-Life 1 and 2 both hold up pretty well in a lot of ways, and they're obviously great games, but they're also obviously imperfect and dated games, and Half-Life Alex will be no different. So, yeah. VR has problems. Not everyone will be able to accept those concessions. Not everyone will like it. But you know what? Not everyone likes video games generally. Not everyone likes movies. Not everyone likes anime, although everyone should. Not everyone likes, well, anything. <laughs> Nothing can be liked by everyone, but many of these things are still lucrative industries, because nothing needs to appeal to everyone to be good, or successful, or worthwhile. Just some things are liked by more people than other things, and that's fine. That's good, even. VR will always be a niche product, but you know how you make money off of a niche product? You make it as accessible as possible to as many people as possible, so the people who want it can have it. The internet has proven, time and time again, that this simple principle is a recipe for success. From Kickstarter to Netflix to Steam to, yes, even this garbage website, all of these things have created new grounds for creators to tread, revealed audiences we never knew were there, and platformed new and fresh voices we could never have heard before. Broadly speaking, all of these services 
and the artworks and the innovations that they have given rise to have proven that more people participating in economic activity in choosing what comes of all their labor is a good thing. Imagine what more good might come of it if all of those people got to choose how the infrastructure of the services was run. And these innovations, indeed, include VR. So, sure, VR might not set the world on fire, but I don't find I don't like it, and a lot of other people don't, so it won't succeed a very compelling argument against it. But here's something I do find compelling. As I've gotten older, I've closed the gap between myself and video games a great deal. I've also seen it widen ever further. I've built a gaming PC, and with it I've gotten to try many of the games and the game genres I was so curious about or fascinated by. I've discovered new games, I've learnt of new genres, and still yet more worlds on platforms I don't own, or have limited access to, or games I simply haven't been able to fit in my budget or found time for. I've borrowed games from friends, I've emulated older titles, but I've still been limited in what I've been able to play. There have been a great many video ideas I've had covering games I'd love to play, but I'm largely locked out of the conversation on them. Games like Death Stranding, like most of the Yakuza series, like the new Final Fantasy, and yes, Half-Life Alex. Before this whole disaster happened, I had moved yet again, and was looking to put down roots, get a proper job and some income, while I tried to grow my YouTube channel and hopefully get that to be more viable. My desktop and my PS4 have had to go in boxes while I tried to find a more permanent living arrangement. I was supposed to be in this apartment only a couple weeks before I moved again, and now I've been here for over a month. But I'm lucky. I'm fortunate enough to come from a fairly privileged background, with plenty of social and financial advantages, some of which have been negated by the fact that I'm a neurodivergent weirdo. But even though I've burned many bridges and run out of money, finding new bridges to walk hasn't been all that hard, or well, not as hard as I'm sure it is for some other folks. I'm privileged enough to have a YouTube channel, after all. So, while I'm not in the best position during this crisis, well, I was already unemployed. Remember how I said that the internet proved more people participating in economic activity is a good thing? Well, the people in charge of the economy right now sure don't. Many of the articles I've seen talking about why Half-Life Alex hasn't done numbers have either ignored or discounted the affordability argument, because the technology is now slightly less prohibitively expensive, ignoring, of course, that millions of citizens across the world, particularly the Millennials and Zoomers who might be most interested in playing a Half-Life game, are drowning in austerity, debt, unemployment, and, uh, dying because of COVID, and soon because of the oncoming climate crisis. Many Americans, myself included, can't cover an unexpected $400 expense. Don't you think think maybe this is not a situation conducive to more people participating in the economy. Maybe this is a market that stifles innovation, rather than breeding it, if people can't afford food and housing and travel, let alone a costly, spaciously demanding luxury like VR. Maybe, just maybe, if more people had more money, they would spend more money to, uh buy things, like money is ostensibly meant to do. Maybe, instead of fighting for their lives, people might live. 
Maybe I wouldn't have to make my video essays in spite of the life I live. Because I care about doing this, because I am slightly better positioned to sacrifice my time to do this than some other people, something I am by no means unique in, many game developers, many creators in general, in many industries, have similarly had to risk everything in the hopes of creating something successful that'll be able to make them some money doing the things they care about. Because, as it so happens, art is a human need, and it's a human thing to do, to make terrible life decisions for the sake of art, in spite of a terrible economy that leads to terrible lives. Imagine how many more great innovations, great artistic experiences, great things in general we could have, how many more people might be able to participate in those experiences if all of those people could live. There's a good reason that economists, actual ass economists, not tinfoil hat weirdos, keep saying that Bernie Sanders' policies would be good for the economy. Because when people can live, when people can breathe their life into the economy, that is a good fucking thing. I should probably note that Valve, as a company, is by no means a victim of these economic conditions, or indeed a victim at all. They're a business, and they are a part of this system as much as any other company. They knew that making this game wouldn't be the most profitable thing to do, and they decided to do it anyway, because they could take the short-term hit. Half-Life Alex, while an incredible piece of art, is also also an expensive venture by one of the most profitable companies in the country, seeking to justify their investment into a new and risky technology yet to be widely adopted, only because companies like Valve, but bigger, are actively siphoning away wealth from the regular people who might otherwise buy this game. And I'm glad that Alex exists and is as great a work of art as it is, but I think it'd be nice if it could exist for its own sake, because of it being a good idea and advancing the medium, rather than because Valve needed it to exist and to be good, to sell this admittedly impressive technology to more of the few people who can afford it. VR will probably always remain a fairly niche thing. It might never get big, but it sure as hell could get bigger. And this shit isn't helping. Covid hasn't been good for the film industry. It can't be good for the video game industry. And the climate crisis, when it fully takes off, won't be good for the entertainment industry, or indeed any industry. So, in conclusion, if you decide to experience a game that you can't afford, or can't or don't want to play for whatever other reason by watching a Let's Play of it, that's valid. And if you want more people to buy and play video games, to contribute to the livelihoods of game developers, to try out VR, or to do anything really, to help facilitate new innovations, to help prove the market for risky ideas, to fill jobs, to create jobs, to advance culture, to advance society. Fix the economy, stupid. Hi everyone, I've had a bad time of it, but I'm okay. I'm glad this video is finally done so I can finally forget about it and move on with other stuff. This entire situation has made me rethink a lot, so I think this will probably be the last super explicitly political thing I do for a little while. I don't really know what the point of making this was, but if you got something out of it, I'm glad of that, and I thank you for your time. 
I suppose it's also worth noting that I do not work in the video game industry or anything. Like, one of my online girlfriends is an indie game developer and all, and that's nice, but I have the same information as you do, probably, my own personal experiences, and this is just the conclusion I personally drew with what I had. I'm sure that the reality is much more complicated than I know, so don't take anything I say in this video as absolute or authoritative or whatever. That applies in general, of course, but especially so here, I think. So anyway, go to my Patreon or Ko-Fi, subscribe, like, bell, whatever you want. And special thanks to uh, Athayet, Tis, and Eli Bergmas. There's going to be a 1k Q&A video soon, and hopefully sometime after that, a rant slash review slash analysis video about Machia Record. And hopefully that'll be enough to recover my channel with the sequel to my most popular video ever made, and I can perhaps finally finish the Monogatari analysis or other stuff if I get out of this garbage creative slump that I've been in. I don't know. I'll do something, anyway. Okay, bye-bye.